Britain is world famous for its stately homes. And when it comes to food, our country houses were the tastemakers. Curry and gockle, it's an absolute first for me. In this series, we'll sample delicious dishes. They look wonderful, Mary. And enjoy the lavish hospitality that these homes were celebrated for. It is absolutely stunning. I'll show you how to cook tasty modern recipes inspired by the history of our great houses. This is actually Napoleon's chair from Waterloo. Mind you, I could do with a cushion. Join me as I meet the families who own these exceptional homes. The best thing about the staircase, obviously, is going down on a tray or on your bottom. <gasps> and find out what it's really like to live. That looks quite saucy. Work was very like cutting a hedge. I think you're better at baking. <laughs> and party in the nation's most beautiful stately homes. I'm not going to drop it. <laughs> this week, I'm meeting the Yar family, breathing new life into Powderham Castle. You like it, Jackie? <laughs> I love it. And I'll join them at a magical woodland party to thank everyone who's helped them settle in. It's been quite a journey. The fairy tales happen. This is your invitation to dine at some of Britain's grandest tables in some of the most beautiful houses in the land. I'm in Devon, just south of Exeter, crossing the great estuary of the River X. I just love Devon, even on a blustery, a rather misty day. The smell of the sea, it's all very tempting. And waiting to meet me is the Earl of Devon himself, Charlie Courtney. Hello, Mary. Oh, it's lovely to be back in Devon. <laughs> Thank you for coming in this lovely weather. Oh, oh who cares? <laughs> Charlie's family has been connected to this estuary for over 600 years. You know, the estuary is such a remarkably vibrant place. I think in medieval times it was something like England's second or third biggest port. Was it? And so we were a French family, and all the trading from Exeter would have gone out to, to, to the south of France, to Bordeaux and around there, and they would have brought wine back and wool out. So it was a, very much a sort of trading estuary. way to the house that's been the Courtney family home since 1391, Powdrum Castle. There it is in all its glory, Powdrum Castle. So there's Powdrum Castle. Flag flying. Yes, that's my flag, the Earl of Devon's flag. I think I'm the 28th generation of the family to move my kids in. It's rather nice. I feel as though there ought to have been a drawbridge here. I know, well, we, we, we've stood down the nights from the top. Charlie inherited Powdrum two years ago on the death of his father. Before then, he, his wife, and their two young children had been living in America for 11 years. Let's get in out of the rain yes. and you can tell me more. And now, as Earl of Devon, he's become the custodian of one of the oldest aristocratic titles in the country. Welcome to Powderham. And a sprawling castle which has evolved over six centuries. So, Mary, this is the big dining room, which, uh, for all its appearances, is actually the most modern room in the house. It was built by the Victorians, effectively to provide a really nice functional space to have big dinner parties and... It's one that we use a lot as a family for sort of Christmas dinners, Christmas lunches. I can just imagine this room as it is with a roaring fire. Oh, we've yeah. been out in all that cold. I know, um, it's a good place to warm up after, after a morning outside. And even though it's the most modern room in the house, um, it tells a very old story because it has, throughout the coats of arms on the walls, the family tree, effectively, dating back to Athon in the far corner, who was a a French knight who fortified a town called Courtenay in France in about 1000 AD. So he was the original Courtney. And you see the story of the family line ever since up to uh, William, who built the room in 1830. 
The Courtney family have an impressive lineage, but now I want to meet the next generation. Come on through and meet the family. <laughs> Mary, this is uh, my wife, AJ. Hello, Hello AJ. Really and nice this is Jocelyn. Hi. I love the hat. And Jack, my son. Uh -huh. <laughs> so this is actually where you live, sort of within the castle. Yeah. It feels yeah. very cosy here. Oh, it is cosy. Yeah, it's actually nice and warm. And I recognise an American accent, is that right? Yeah. Oh. AJ and I met in a bar in Las Vegas. <laughs> Um, I was on a rugby tour, AJ was on a hen weekend. And, and the rest is Jocelyn and Jack. <laughs> oh, lovely. <laughs> yeah. And how's England for you? The main problem is the weather. Yes. We're used to warm, yes. scorching. Spoiled so cow and when we come here, we're just like... <laughs> ah, but you've got the beauty of Devon. Yes. <laughs> I most likely will need a bit of help later making a Devon cream tea. Can I rely on you two? I don't know how to make one. You know how to eat it. Cream first, then jam. Right, have we'll have it that way. But now I want to see the rest of the house. Yes. Come on, I... let's go through his door Ooh, and explore the house. Like Cowdrum began as a medieval castle, but it was in the 18th century that the modern house took shape. From the magnificent music room for grand entertaining, to the elegant libraries. This was a home designed to impress. And here's the staircase hall. What an extraordinary, glorious colour. Yeah, it's powder and blue. It's a very unique colour. I interestingly had a call from a French count a couple of months ago, asking to reproduce it in his French castle. Um, so it, it, it's the powder and blue, and people obviously seem to like it. What striking plasterwork. It was done by a couple of local Exeter craftsmen, but what you notice in, in the top corners, there's a different animal. There's a squirrel here, there's something like a, 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 a stoat there. And a hare with great long ears and birds, lots of birds. It's depicting the countryside. Absolutely, and it depicts the pursuits of people that lived in the castle when it was built. So 1750, you could see the musical instruments they were playing. A violin or something. It almost looks like cake icing, doesn't it? It does. Very beautifully done, too. Yeah. All that's missing is a lady coming down in all a marvellous dress, billowing out. Imagine all the men standing here with their drinks, watching them all coming downstairs. The best thing about the staircase, obviously, is going down on a tray or on your bottom. When I was a child, we didn't have carpets on the stairs, and it was just a plain wooden staircase. You get really good speed going up down the stairs. Yes, because you couldn't slide down the banisters because you get stuck halfway. Yeah. On a tray would be a good idea. Great fun. I'll show you the marble hall. So this is the, uh, the marble hall, which is the, um, the bottom half of the old medieval great hall. On the far side of the hall, you see the old medieval archways. And the archways go to the buttery, the kitchen, and the pantry. And a whole meal would be processed from the kitchen down the corridor, through that door, to the big table up there. The whole purpose of the house was cooking and serving food. And entertaining. And entertaining, exactly. But there's no food coming from that kitchen now. No, well, we'll go and have a look and see if we can make something happen. Today, Charlie and AJ do their own cooking in their private family kitchen. But in the 19th century, this house employed over 30 domestic servants, including cooks and kitchen maids. The kitchen they worked in has been perfectly preserved. No, this is the, uh, the Victorian kitchen. It is so lofty and big. And the copper, gosh, I'm glad I don't have to clean that. Yes, I mean, what's amazing about this space is it's been the kitchen of the castle since 1390 when the castle was built. So you can sort of think of 600 years of just preparing food and feasting from this kitchen. But in the 20th century, the grand entertaining came to an end. In the 10, 20 years after the war, you know, the butler left, housemaids left, 
My grandparents had to diversify, you know, generate an income and open it to visitors. And that was a learning curve exactly. because you find out you need a tea room. Exactly. So here's my grandmother, Venetia, overseeing the baking of the scones. She'd have loved to have met you, Mary. <sighs> you know, I couldn't come to Devon without having a cream tea, a Devon cream tea. Would you like to see my scones? I think they're very special. They're crispy on the outside and all soft and spongy in the middle. Oh, Mary. We would be honoured and would really, really enjoy to have some of your cream tea. There's nothing more tempting than warm homemade scones fresh from the oven. This recipe is a classic. To please everyone, I'm making both plain and fruit scones. So for my scones, this is the recipe I've done year in, year out, and it seems to be a very good one. The ingredients couldn't be simpler. 450 grams of self-raising flour, then for extra lightness, two teaspoons of baking powder. 50 grams of sugar and 100 grams of butter. I've made more scones in my time than I can think of because the ingredients you've always got on the shelf, they're very easy to make. Just rub it and lift the air into it until it looks like breadcrumbs. Next, I'm beating two eggs and adding milk to bring it up to 300 ml. Then I use a knife and I just work it in. It'll be a fairly sticky dough and that's what I want and I won't handle it too much. And the little bit that is at the bottom I'll use to brush over the scones to give them a nice shiny top. That looks like a nice sticky dough, not too dry. Now it's ready to shape. I've got some flour over here. So I'm putting my hand in there so that as I work it all together, it won't stick to my hand. Well, not too much anyway. So bring it together. And then onto a floured table, and just tip that out. And I'm not doing an awful lot of kneading. I'm going to cut it in half. One half I'll keep for the plain scones, and the other half I'll mix with the sultanas. Knead those in. You don't really need a rolling pin, just pat it all over. Now, what I'd really like are two little helpers. Oh! There we are. How about Jack? You come here. Have you made scones before? Um, no. No? Oh, what about you? Not really. So, what I do when I'm cutting them out is to get a little pile, and what you do is just do that, and it stops it sticking. OK. And wriggle it, like that, backwards and forwards. That's it. Oh, that looks a beauty. We'll pop the scones on a greased baking tray, flour side down. Right, now, we want them with shiny tops. A little bit on each one. Try not to get it too down the sides, because if you do, it sticks to the tray. So, Jocelyn, when you came from America, what was it like to come over here to live in a castle? Did you ever get lost? I got lost for 20 minutes trying to find um, the kitchen for breakfast. I expect there are many places to play hide-and-seek. Yes. A lot. My parents have said that we probably shouldn't play it because once one of my friends got very much lost. Gracious. <laughs> Our scones are ready for the oven. Bake them at 200 degrees fan for about 10 minutes until they're crisp and golden. And then for the ultimate test. Serving our Devon cream tea. <gasps> to the Earl and Countess oh, of Devon. Made. That is amazing. <laughs> or Mum and Dad to Jocelyn and Jack. Now, what goes next, A well-made scone. The cream before the jam. Cream, the cream before the jam. This is yeah. because we are in Devon, is that right? Yes, yeah. we were doing some interviews for positions and Charlie put the question, cream on top or jam on top? If they got it wrong, I just couldn't save them. <laughs> and the first recorded account of a cream tea, apparently, comes from the archive of Tavistock Abbey, 
Following a Viking invasion in 997 AD, they knocked down the abbey. And in order to rebuild it, they employed a number of craftsmen. And it was the Earl of Devon, a predecessor of mine called Odewald. He, uh, he ordered them scones, cream and jam. Well, that is a good heritage, isn't it? <laughs> Proves we invented it, not the Cornish. That's quite a claim. But I imagine it takes more than cream teas to keep a house like Powderham going. The castle is set on a three and a half thousand acre estate. It's home to a working farm as well as a magnificent deer park run by gamekeeper Dick Durrant. The deer, to me, they look like little bambies. Yeah, I mean, they're a super looking so animal. So pretty. But... Dick started looking after the deer here nearly 20 years ago when Charlie's father was still Earl. The deer herd originates from post-English Civil War, so about 300 years. And so it's kept going through all the family, through all the generations, and is continuing. So yes, nothing I, changes. Exactly. I mean, that's part of the reason I really enjoy working in this landscape, is that you're working in a piece of almost living history. And because it's been in the same family ownership for the past 600 or so years, it has changed, but still looks incredibly similar. Every year, the Powderham Estate attracts around 35,000 visitors from all over the UK. But there are some guests who travel from much further afield. This must be a wonderful landscape for wildfire. It's so peaceful. Yeah, during the winter, you'll see large amounts of widgeon and teal. The birds nest in the northwest of Russia. Gracious. Yeah, no, so, so they come, come all that way to yes. here. Yeah, to... the comfort of our winter. Do you shoot any of the wild duck? Yeah, we do shoot um, a very, very small percentage of them each year, um, which we would take away and eat, obviously. Duck has been on the menu at Powderham for over 300 years, but you don't need to live on a country estate to enjoy it. This is my pan-fried breast of duck served with a rich apple sauce with Calvados in honor of the Courtney family's French heritage. I really like duck, and so often over the years, I've done it duck a la range, but it goes really well with apples. I like to remove the skin, use a sharp knife for any tough bits. So that's come off very nicely. Season the duck breasts. That's it then fry them in a hot pan for four minutes on each side. Right, that looks a bit of all right. Lovely colour there. Turn it over. That smells pretty good. Once they're evenly cooked on both sides, leave them to rest for 15 minutes. And resting is all important. Why? Because the heat that you've had on the outside will go on cooking, and also it makes it more tender. Then it's on to my apple and calvados sauce, made with eating apples. I'm going to do it in butter because I want the buttery taste. There's a tiny little bit of residue from the duck, and that will help to give a little bit of brown to my apples. Gently cook the apple slices until they're tender and golden. Now that's getting soft, but not quite. The reason why I wouldn't use something like a brownie, a cooking apple, because it gets to this stage and it would be a beautiful buttery mush, and I don't want that. I want to have a bit of texture within the sauce. I reckon we're there. Now leave the apple to cool. That's it. Then it's time for the star of my sauce, Calvados. Of course, Calvados is apple brandy. I'm using 100 ml, and I'm just going to evaporate that just until it's half. That'll drive off the alcohol. Mind you, that smell, it makes me think of Christmas. It makes me think of special things. It's lovely. Once the Calvados has reduced by half, it's on to the next part of the sauce. 100 ml of stock and 200 ml of apple juice. Add to the pan and reduce again. I want the sauce to be slightly thickened, so I'm going to do that with corn flour instead of flour. It gives a more translucent look to the sauce. Mix a teaspoonful of corn flour with a splash of apple juice. 
add some of the sauce. In it goes. Give that a good stir. Back into the pan there. And bring it to the boil, stirring as it thickens. I'm going to add the apple to it now and take it off the heat. I don't want that apple to go all mushy. For an extra hit of flavour and colour, add any remaining juices from the meat to the pan. Right, we're ready to serve. I want it to be a gentle pink, and I think that's just what I've achieved, and I'm rather pleased about that. I reckon that took me about half an hour to make. Oh, so simple to do, and yet so special. And who better to sample it than the Countess? Or AJ, as she's known to everyone here at Powdrum. AJ. Come in. <laughs> I hope you're hungry. Come in and have a taste. Oh, it smells amazing. I feel very lucky right now. It's perfect. The sauce isn't too rich. That you no can cream take in there. The... No, no cream at it's all. It's a perfect combination. So how did you come to be Countess here when you've come from America? <laughs> I met him at a bar in Vegas. I had organized um, a bachelorette weekend. A hen weekend. A hen weekend. And I was on a TV show at the time, so I could get a really cool suite. You were doing a show, you, so you were acting? Yes. Before she moved to Powdrum, AJ enjoyed a successful career as an actress in America. Over the years, she starred in shows including Seinfeld, My So-Called Life, and Baywatch. So, <laughs> as an actress, you were in a bar, and I looked across the bar, and I smacked my girlfriend, and I said, that one, yum. I can see you <laughs> saying that, too. Well, who wouldn't? <laughs> and he was just smiling and flopping his floppy hair, and we just looked at each other and smiled. So when you got to know uh, Charlie mm -hmm. quite well we're in Las Vegas, <laughs> did you know, in fact, Mary. that he had a title? No, no. One of the guys said, um, hey, that's a good one. He's royalty. And, um, but I didn't... I didn't take it in? No. And then the next morning, I called my mom and I said, Mom, I've met the guy. We had a rendezvous in New York, like a month later. Letters started coming and then phone calls like clockwork. And then we went to Isle of Skye and then we drove back and he said, do you want to meet my parents? And um, I was like, wow, serious. And we show up at this house and it's like this long driveway, then these amazing gardens and then this stone castle comes up. And I was just like, Whoa, this can't be for real. And it still happens where you look out and just go, it's magic. That is a truly romantic story. I can only guess what it must have been like for AJ moving to this very different world and taking on this vast house with centuries of history and tradition. Today, she's invited me to share some of the remarkable family stories she's discovered. Oh, oh, oh. What splendor! <laughs> well, this is the state bed, the place where Charlie's father was born. When Charlie and I first got here to the house, we started walking through rooms and opening drawers and just seeing what's where. And we found, we found this. Come see. Hundreds of love letters. And these are from Charlie's grandparents, from Christopher to Venetia and from Venetia to Christopher. So they met when Venetia was married to the Earl of Cottenham, his cousin. Oh, married before. Yes, this was a bit of a scandal. And he traveled a lot and wasn't uh -huh. very present. That's where the, yeah. that's where the that's trouble where the starts. starts. And this is a beautiful picture of Venetia. And she was a very striking woman. Beautiful skin. Eyes. Yeah. And this is Christopher. So they met and fell in love and had this passionate, romance, and these are all the letters before they got married. Can you see it? Look at this one. My wife, my best armchair, my private sanctum, our home. Very intense, very romantic. I mean, it's just fantastic. <laughs> no. They are ripped open. Look at the tops. No, you and they are... I'm so excited. The letter's Let's coming. See. I want to know what's inside. Yes. This is from Christopher. I could not sleep. It was 10 o'clock, and I asked your picture if it could help me. It is marvelous how I can have a conversation with you when we are miles apart and how you seem to put new life into me and help me always. 
It's all very touching, isn't it? It is. And he had just inherited Powderham at age 19 after three relatives passed away in succession. Then finally they got married and they could be together and they were in the house together for one month and then he got called to war. And what happened to him? He was had a it? brutal war. Mm -hmm. And he was never the same after the war. It's a real drama. It's a real life love story. And it's something we relate to because I wouldn't be here if it weren't for, for Charlie having written me love letters. <laughs> and then this, oh, this we have in the other room. Would you like to see some coronation robes? I'd love to. In 1953, Christopher and Benicia attended the Queen's coronation. They cared for Powdrum until Christopher's death in 1998. So this is what Christopher and Venetia wore. Would you like to try a coronet? Aha. <laughs> Are you sure? Go for it. <laughs> that one's a lot more comfortable than the little one. I'd have probably been better at it if I went to the finishing schools. You gotta balance it more. Look at that. That looks quite saucy. One shake and it would drop on the floor. Right. And I dare say well, it's quite valuable. Well, this one does have the little strap. So if there is in the future a coronation, you would be wearing these robes. Would I? Wow. Because <laughs> I'm a little short for that one. After all, you are a countess. Yeah, exactly. No, and it's like moving into this house. What are you doing? You're you're embodying this role and you study it. I mean, the title of Countess to me just means, you know, that we're the ones that have to look after the place. This castle was built in support of its community. So I'm actually really interested in strengthening ties and finding out what purpose we can serve. This is my favorite little cottage on the estate. They've just cut it all back. This morning, AJ is showing me how she's opening up the castle with a new Magical project based in the old kitchen garden. This is a great warble here. Yes, this is the walled garden. So this supplied the house with all the food and everything, but in modern days, they've kind of been used for charities, and this has become a very, very magical place. Powdrum recently invited a local charity to take over the old Victorian greenhouses. The Dawlish Gardens Trust provides training and support to people with physical and learning disabilities. Hi, Jeanette. Hi, Would you like to meet Mary? Nice to see you. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> Mary. Hello. Jeanette. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes. If I can introduce the guys that we have here, we have Natasha and Caroline. They are both deaf people, and Caroline is also deaf-blind. Oh. It looks as though you're planting pumpkins. Why pumpkins? In the castle, they have treasure hunts. For the visitors, and, so lots uh, of kids come. And when they complete the treasure hunt and get all the questions right, then they can have a pumpkin to take home. To and wonderful to, to have such great, great yeah. help. Yes, <laughs> and it's also wonderful. We have a great space to offer, and they're growing all the vegetables for all, to feed all the animals here. In the beginning, when we first came, we were just in one third of the section, but we worked so well that we actually moved into the middle section. You'll see all our people be busy out there planting and picking. Yep. They've done mosaics and crafts and photography, and it's just a wonderful space. And this is something that I see Powderham doing so naturally. You know, it, it was built to protect and serve its community, and we feel very lucky to have them around. As a thank you to everyone who's helped them recently, AJ and Charlie will be hosting a special party during my visit. Oh, just what I need. And they're beautifully young. I think that'll be about enough. And I think it would be lovely to use some of their own delicious veg in a recipe I'm sure everyone will enjoy. This is my refreshing midsummer salad, along with tender broad beans from the greenhouse. I'm using asparagus, figs, and goat's cheese, all drizzled with a Dijon mustard dressing. Start by podding the broad beans. Then it's on to the asparagus. Cut off the tips and slice the stalks diagonally, which I think is an attractive touch. So all those I'm gonna cook in boiling salted water for three minutes, just until they're tender. Cook them any longer and they'll lose their color and they'll lose their flavor. Pop them in boiling water. 
season well, and after three minutes, they'll be ready. It should be a beautiful, bright green colour, but to keep that colour, they need to go straight into cold water. Next, I like to take the cooked broad beans out of their skins, if there's time. And then when you get inside, look at that, it's a beautiful, bright green colour. Then take some ripe figs, cut off the tops and slice them into quarters. Now I've got some little gem lettuces. Just take off the base of that and then leaving the root on so it holds together, just cut it in thin slices. So that's our base. Arrange the lettuce on a large plate, add the figs, some of the mixed salad leaves and a sprinkling of colourful micro herbs, followed by the blanched beans and the asparagus, and pepper and salt. You're certainly going to get lots of textures here. You'll get a bit of crunch from the asparagus, and those beans have still got texture. Now take some goat's cheese, cut off the rind and crumble it over the salad. The cheese gives it a real lift and a lovely flavour. OK, you don't like goat's cheese. Use feta. And finally, on to the dressing. Chop some chives and add a teaspoon of caster sugar to a bowl. Then I'm going to put a teaspoonful of Dijon mustard in there and about a teaspoon of lemon juice. Then add a clove of crushed garlic and six tablespoons of mild olive oil. And it will thicken a bit because the mustard always makes it a little bit thick. Season with pepper and salt. Then in go the chives. Then I'm going to just drizzle that over the top. And don't put this dressing on until the last minute. The whole effect, I think, is lovely. I really hope Charlie and AJ's party guests will enjoy it. So there it is, my midsummer salad. Beautifully healthy, rather different, and great for a special occasion. This is great. A storm brewing, it's quite fun, isn't it? Lovely. For centuries, Powdrum has been defined by its location on the estuary of the River X, a place for both trade and for pleasure. On a day like this, there couldn't be anywhere better than being in the estuary. The estuary is amazing. The, the family have always had a great connection to the estuary, particularly through sailing. Powdrum was always approached from the sea back in the days. And there was a harbour right in front of the castle before they built the railway line that overlooks this amazing main road, effectively, up and down from Exeter out to the sea. As Lord of the Manor of Powdrum, Charlie owns much of the foreshore along the River X, which he leases to local shellfish growers. We're now, I think, approaching high tide. At low tide, so much of this is all mud banks, mud flats. And this is where you get all the mussels and all the cockles and all the amazing seafood. But people pick all sorts of shellfish down here. It's an absolutely lovely source of food. As we come up, we're coming towards the Starcross Yacht Club. And the Yacht Club has been sailing this estuary since at least 1770s. It has a claim to being the oldest sailing club, the oldest yacht club in England. It was formed originally in the village of Starcross by an ancestor of mine, William II Viscount, along with his friends. And in the 1950s, they moved from Starcross up to the old Powdrum Boathouse. The founding members of the Starcross Yacht Club started a number of unique Powdrum traditions, which still survive to this day. So, Mary, this is one of the earliest illustrations that we have of the castle from the estuary. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lovely print from the mid-1700s, and it shows the family boathouse down here. See? That the Starcross Yacht Club now occupies. But, of course, the other relic that we have from this era, as well as the Yacht Club, is the Starcross Dining Club, which was founded by the same group of gentlemen. And what's wonderful is that dining club, the Starcross Club, still meets at Powdrum, and they still eat the standard starter of curried cockles, using cockles from the estuary, and using curry from uh, all these spice ships that would have been trading up and down the estuary. 
Charlie, curried cockles. Curried cockles. I need to know how to make them. Well, Come let, and show me. Let's go to the big kitchen and have a go. Charlie is going to show me how to cook this historic Powdrum favourite. Fresh Devon cockles, smothered in a creamy curry sauce made with apples, white wine and mango chutney. So here we have the cockles. These would have been harvested out on the estuary. Um, hey, that's fresh, isn't it? Look. <laughs> I have to confess, I have never cooked cockles. I've only had them in the East End in a sort of cup. Right. And I can remember them being frightfully tough. But this is interesting. Charlie starts by frying a large onion. Mm -hmm. We now host um, the cockle dinner here. Which and is how the curry many cockles. Comes? 20 to 30 people. Some new family names, some old family names. Uh, the farmers and the landowners, and they all meet and talk about what's going on. And the first course is always this. Always curry cockles. Now we need to add the famous spices. Charlie is adding garam masala, cumin, ground coriander, and for some heat, a quarter of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper. So this is the curry sauce. And of course, curry, when this was first made in the 1770s, was just becoming popular as a sort of preservative of food in English cooking. And it often disguised flavors that had passed there. Uh, yes. You know, the fish wood was getting a bit stinky and they'd put the curry powder in to disguise it. Exactly. Now, add a generous splash of white wine. Shall I do that for you? Do you want to slosh yeah. it? I'm pretty good at sloshing the wine in. <laughs> 150 ml. Exactly. Perfect. And plenty left for us. <laughs> I'll pop that to one side. Then add 600 ml of fish stock. Shall I stir while yeah, it goes? Stir while I pour it in. As that starts to thicken, pour in 150 ml of cream. Devon knows about the cream. Then chop two eating apples. So that will be coming to the boil and the apple goes in. The point of the apple is to thicken up the sauce a little bit. Now let the sauce simmer for a while and reduce. Right, the next ingredient is some mango chutney. And Charlie is being pretty generous with it. Never be shy on mango chutney. That's far more than most people would add, and I think you're quite right to do it. And it just adds that little bit of sweetness to it. Then add lemon zest, the juice of half a lemon, and season. Should we add the cockles? Go on, then. The cockles should be cooked in advance, soaked in water for several hours, then steamed or boiled. I mean, it depends on whether your guests mind a bit of authentic X for sure in their meal. But if they don't mind it, it's actually quite nice to have them sort of a little bit gritty. This is ready, isn't it? It's we really... just need to add a little bit of garnish. We got some coriander and some parsley, and then we'll serve it on a bed of rice. Curried cockles. That's an absolute first for me. That's brilliant. A bit of that right. works, doesn't it? It really works. This is fabulous, everybody. It is really, really, really good. <laughs> <wonderful. laughs> I mean, who would think of curry and cockles? I promise you, this will be on, this will be yeah. this will be on the cards for me. Powdrum is a castle that's full of cherished traditions. Preserving this heritage is a never-ending task. 34 staircases to clean, 16 state rooms, nearly 40 bedrooms, and over 50 antique clocks, each of which needs to be wound every week, a job Morris Down has been doing for over 40 years. This morning, Charlie is showing me his next big challenge. So, Mary, all the uh, bedrooms in the house are numbered, and these bedrooms up here are known as the 30s, and they've been unoccupied for about 20 or 30 years. And as you'll see, they've sadly fallen into something of a decline, with the paint peeling off the walls, paint. plaster falling off the ceilings. Mold in the corners. But what's wonderful about up here is the treasures of the family have sort of collected for years in these rooms. 
There are so many boxes and trunks. I wonder what's in here. Oh, look. That must have been the top hat. It's a top hat box, absolutely. Is that... It looks like a bath shape. Travelling bath, Victorian. Everything you need for going round the empire. What else is there? What would that be? Oh, it's that, got something written would, on the that front. That would be a tin hat box. It says yeah. C.P. Courtney Esquire. This would have been my Uncle Charlie. Great, great Uncle Charlie. And that's his um, local okay. police helmet. But look down in there. There's a spike. And you unscrew it and put it on the top, would you think? Yeah. There we are. It probably doesn't fit me. No, it's actually a rather small head. His picture in the dining room makes him look like quite a tall man. You're tall but, um, already. Yeah. <laughs> There's an awful lot for you to do here, Charlie. People think, living in a country house like this, that it's all like Downton Abbey and there are butlers and housemaids. But in reality, there's some parts that are just like this. Yeah, constantly you're repairing, constantly you're trying to maintain, constantly you're finding ways to generate a bit more income, but without damaging things and maintaining things. So it's, um, it's a constant balance, but it's a lot of fun. Do you know, this house is like a maze. I could so easily get lost. I'm really glad you're with me. <laughs> I know, it's amazing. When you bring um, even experts around the house, they all find themselves getting lost and, and disoriented because the house is so many different eras and so many different histories all sort of combined together. Um, and there are all these amazing doors here. And then every now and again, they'll add a secret door as well, which takes you somewhere completely different. Goodness and this gracious. is a little servant's passage that takes you from the landing of the staircase through to the minstrel's gallery. Oh. So this is the minstrel's gallery. You can sneak in and no one knows you're here. And there are some lovely holes in the panel here that were made by my grandfather when he was a boy to be able to see what the grown-ups are doing up here. So, Mary, here is the ante room, which is the room that leads into the libraries. And in here, we not only have a few secret doors, but we also have a secret window. Oh, and the whole place lights up. So, Mary, here we are in the libraries. Now, there's a wonderful secret door in the second library. You're going to have to find it. I'm looking for a little cut through. It sort of must be in this section. Ah, I can see here that it's all cut away. Is that right? That's it. Now you've got to find out how to open it. Oh, don't tell me, don't tell me. I want to find it. You're getting warmer. I wonder if there's a button to press. Ah, there's a gap. Maybe I put my hand in here and pull. Yeah. There's a handle at the end, just like a door handle. Exactly. I can't imagine what it's going to reveal. Do you know, it's the most beautiful romantic room in pale pink and turquoise. Oh, can I go through? Please do. Isn't it a wonderful room? Absolutely. And gracious, is that an organ at the end? Yes, yeah, so that's a 1769 organ that's recently been uh, restored and works perfectly again. It's actually called the music room. And it was built for this chap's coming-of-age party. This is Kitty William, the third Viscount. He looks pretty dandy, doesn't he? He was the brother of 13 sisters. He must have been spoilt rotten by them. Exactly. Kitty's father died when he was only a teenager, so he very much became the man of the house. And, of course, when he came of age, he wanted to make a real statement, and he threw a three-day party over a weekend that we had the most amazing records of in the archive. We have some of them over here on the table. That looks like an invitation. Your very own invitation to Kitty's weekend celebration. It's number 567. Well, there were probably about 600 people invited to the weekend as a whole. The ball garnered amazing press and publicity, and there was a lovely article in the Exeter Evening Post. Oh. And it says Friday night was the masquerade, it being particularly observed that no black dominoes 
were to be admitted. And of course, it says that in handwriting on the front of the invitation. What a black, black domino. So a black domino was just a black cloak that some people who weren't trying very hard would wear to a masquerade ball. And you say, well, you can't just half do it. You've got to wear a proper costume. And so Kitty was incredibly keen that everybody should dress up. They ate at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> one o'clock in the morning, I'm ready for bed. <laughs> and the tables were laden with young meat, fruits, preserves. And of course, the food that they served would have been a real statement of intent. And every single person invited to the supper was given a peach on their plate. And a peach in those days was the most exotic and expensive of fruits, but you were really impressing your guests. And it really launched Kitty into society as a man of great substance. As a young man, it seemed Kitty enjoyed a charmed life. But in later years, his fortunes changed. His story then got rather tragic. He developed an affection for a young man called William Beckford. And when they were quite young, they were discovered together in bed at Powderham, and a scandal broke. And that forced Beckford to be exiled. Kitty stayed at Powderham, lived here, but in 1805, someone filed gross indecency charges against him, and he fled, caught a ship bound for Manhattan Island for New York, and in 1815, when Napoleon fell, he moved to Paris. He never returned until he did so in his coffin, and he's buried in Powderham Church. And when I was growing up at Powderham as a kid, there was a huge shame around the gay third Viscount, or the flamboyant third Viscount, as he was told. Oh, sad. We had no record of what Kitty was doing during the time he was in exile. And the assumption was this reprobate was just living it up in France and in America. And then only about 10 years ago, these letters were found in a coal chute in Hampton Wick in South London. And they are the correspondence between Kitty and his lawyer, and he is managing the estate on behalf of Kitty. And this correspondence tells them all about the project for building a chapel at Star Cross, for which Kitty has donated the land and an endowment. And so this character that we all grew up knowing as this sort of reprobate, dissolute man who just left, yeah. is shown to be the most conscientious um, landowner, really caring for the castle, for Star Cross, for the estuary. Um, and it brings him completely back to life. Celebrating Kitty's story is just one of the ways Charlie and AJ are breathing new life into Powdrum. It's been exactly two years since they took over, so tonight, to mark the occasion, they're having a party, and they've chosen a venue that was dear to Kitty's heart. AJ, where are you taking me today? Well, I'm taking you to a very special place. It's one of the treasures that I feel is a hidden gem because it hasn't really been open to the public. I get really excited going this way. It is. It's, it's really lovely coming down here because it's almost like a tunnel of trees. For decades, this woodland garden created in the 1770s was overgrown and neglected. Now, AJ and Charlie are bringing it back to life. Just look at that. <laughs> it is in the middle of nowhere. It is so beautiful. And turn around it's and a folly. It. Look yeah, at that. I know. It's really rather theatrical. You can imagine a Shakespearean play being yes. here and the audience flanked. For me, I just see Midsummer Night. Shakespeare, this is made for it. So what's the story behind this folly? So the folly is built by Kitty Courtney, the third Viscount, to entertain. So Kitty would throw lavish parties, and this would be the setting. Scheming. Perfect place for a party. Perfect place for a party. And this is the two-year anniversary of us moving into the house. So we are thanking our staff and our local community. I mean, we've had massive support from the local community. So it's really just a, a thank you party and letting everyone just be in this space and relax and enjoy it. Dinner. And you're going to feed them? Yes, I might need some help. The garden is being transformed into a magical space for this special celebration. 
Meanwhile, I have a job to do too. I'm making a luxurious fruit pud using fresh Devon ingredients inspired by Kitty's extravagant birthday party. Kitty did things in great style. He gave everybody a peach, which was a sheer luxury at that time. So in Kitty's honor, I'm going to make a pudding with peaches and I'm calling it a peach posset. First, I'm going to skin six ripe peaches. I'm going to drop them into boiling water and then loosen the skin, just like you do for a tomato. As soon as the skin starts to loosen, plunge them in cold water to cool down. Then it's a matter of just peeling them gently. And doing it like this means, can you see, you get that lovely mottly pink color. If you try to do it with a knife, you lose all that. Next, chop the peaches into cubes. I'm going to add a couple of tablespoons of light muscovado sugar. That gives it a nice tinge of gold. And then some brandy. Adding the brandy to the peaches means, one, it gives a terrific flavour, and two, it stops it discolouring, because you wouldn't like little brown pieces at the bottom. Two tablespoons is enough. Then I'm going to just stir that all together. And you leave that to marinate. I like this recipe because it's so easy, so simple. And now for the topping, a traditional English dessert called a posset. My interpretation of a posset is lemon, cream and sugar. Often it's in a glass on its own, but the addition of peaches makes it very special. Add the zest and juice of a large lemon to a pan and 75 grams of caster sugar and 300 ml of double cream and stir it gently until it comes to the boil. It's really a bit like thick custard, but I promise you it tastes a far cry from that. As soon as it's bubbling, take it off the heat, pour that into the jug and let it cool. Now divide the peach mixture between six glasses leaving space for the posset topping. Make sure that they are pressed down so that the liquid is level, and that means the posset won't run down the side. I like it when there's not too much of this lovely, rich, lemony topping and masses of fruit underneath. Hmm. Quite pleased with that. Four hours, they will be set. I usually do it overnight because I like to get ahead. When they're fully set, they're ready for the finishing touch. You could do all sorts of things. You could put any edible flower, pansies or a tiny nasturtium, but I've got some borage here. So you just catch hold of the middle like that and pull off the stalk. I would like to put three in the middle of each one. It's very delicate, it's very summery, and it looks as though you've taken extra trouble. I think those look very, very special, perfect for a party. <laughs> the time for the celebration has finally arrived. I can't wait to see the garden in all its party glory. Hi, Mary. Isn't this enchanting? <laughs> You've know. worked so hard. Uh, and look, it's all laid. How many are you expecting? About three million. <laughs> <laughs> are we? <laughs> Hello! <laughs> oh, it's ugly. It's got so many. Running a place like Powdrum requires a huge team effort. Are you excited? Yes. Mary, this is Anita and Lise. Hello. To a uh, local you. family who have sort of helped us out over the past couple of years, an awful lot. Friends, family, staff and neighbours 
everyone who has helped Charlie and AJ since they took over has been invited to this very special celebration. And there's a wonderful feast in store for them. You and AJ have made me so immensely welcome, and what a finale this is. It is just magical. And I hope they all enjoy my contributions. My crispy midsummer salad. Delicious. Oh, yes, I can. Absolutely delicious. <laughs> and of course, that special powder and pud, my delicate peach posset. It's a very informal celebration for a very informal family. It's the two-year anniversary of Charlie and I driving up with the kids in a moving van to a castle. And I want to thank all of you for being a part of our adventure. And um, it's true. Fairy tales happen. Just all of you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say, Mary, thank you. You've been so brave, uh, braving the sailing <laughs> and the attics and the curried cockles. <laughs> They're good. So thank you, Mary, and, and thank you, everybody, for making this really special. I've loved every minute of my visit to Powdrum, a very different stately home. It's a place with over 600 years of history and tradition, both a family home and the heart of a vibrant community. And it's wonderful to see how a new generation is keeping it safe for the future. Next time, I visit Goodwood, where the March family have breathed new life into a great estate. What I tell the grandchildren? Good. Laugh at Goodwood. I get to peek below stairs. So here we go, Mary. This is where I keep my secret stash and bake for a magnificent cricket tea. So fresh, if it falls apart, it's not my fault.